welcome everyone to GeoHug. Uh, so before we kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. So I'm gonna hand over today's introduction to Russell Mears, who was amazing in helping me track down Steve to get him on today. So thanks so much, Russell. Thanks, Jess, thanks, Jess. Yes, the connection with Steve is interesting. Our, uh, our daughter and her family have lived in Whistler, up the Sea to Sky region since 2012. And every time we visited them, I've been fascinated by the geology as you drive up from Vancouver, the 100 Ks to Whistler, you drive around the side of uh, Howe Sound, lots of fjords, then through whole volcanic belts with Columna Basalt beside the highway and a peak called Black Tusk, a volcanic peak looking over you. Then you get up to Whistler where you've got lots of snow fields and glaciers um, and U-shaped valleys. And I've always wondered what the interaction between the glaciers and the volcanics might've been. And I started searching a couple of years ago and I found Steve and I found his wonderful public videos explaining a whole lot of the geology of sea to sky uh, in, a, in an expert sort of way. So um, I contacted Steve and he's agreed to talk to us today on the Sea to Sky Fire and Ice um, story. Um, Steve's a very practical field oriented geologist. He's had a long career. His focus lately has been communicating geology to the community, particularly um, through the Fire and Ice story of the Sea to Sky. And he's one of the, he's the leaders of the team developing the Fire and Ice Aspiring Geopark. So thanks, Steve, over to you. Yeah, so I'm gonna be talking today about one of the one of the features that uh, was formed by fire and ice in the region, it's called Garibaldi Lake. And so I've been uh, doing some mapping of lakes there that were formed by lava flows interacting with ice and then the lakes formed thereafter. So I'm going to uh, talk specifically about a couple of lakes today near Garibaldi Lake. And what I wanted to do first was just set the scene uh, sort of with some, some video to give you a sense for uh, why Russell's going to be back to this region, I imagine, as soon as he as he can, um, and then also use this intro video to um, thank some supporters and individuals and companies that have allowed me to do some of this research. So here we go. Okay, so that sets the scene sort of geographically. Now let's set it up geologically and tectonically. So as we zoom in here on, on North America, of course, we're gonna be looking up here in, in British Columbia. And so we have the Juan de Fuca plate, which is a really small oceanic plate that's moving to the east underneath the North American plate. And the Pacific plate, as you can see here, based on warm colors being young, cooler colors being old, is moving off to the Northwest to, over here to Japan. And so this small, Wanda Fuka plate again is moving east and subducting underneath the North American plate and causing mountains for, for two reasons. Of course, we have tectonic compression creating the coast mountain belt that runs up presume, the coast here into British Columbia from the United States. And then we have these small white dots are which are the snow capped volcanoes of the Cascade volcanoes in the US. And then they actually extend into Canada. They take this left hand jog into Canada with Mount Garibaldi and Mount Meager sort of being our local volcanoes um, near Vancouver, so created by this subduction zone. So as we zoom in a little bit here, just to give you a better geographic orientation, the uh, Vancouver metropolitan area is down here. This is the Howe Sound Fjord, as Russell mentioned, the Highway 99, the famous highway 
goes along the fjord and then up into the mountains to Whistler, the town of Whistler, which is right here, Lacombe Peak being one of the ski hills that the Olympics were on, and then Pemberton up here to the north, and then I'll talk a bit about the volcano Mount Meager up here to the northwest. Right now, I'm up about 20 kilometers from Squamish up the Squamish Valley right here underneath the beautiful Tantalus mountain range right on the banks of the Squamish River in the uh, Squamish Nation Territory. And so, as Russell mentioned, we have a fire and ice uh, aspiring geopark. We've applied to be a UNESCO geopark, and we're in the process of, of trying to uh, get that status. And so I just put put in place what I'm going to talk about today in the geopark narrative. And so this is the icon that we created for the geopark. And so um, each color signifies one of the pillars of, of our story. And down here, you can see from 250 million years to the present. And so here in sort of this uh, brownish color, we have the foundation of the mountain. The last 250 million years, mountains have, have come and gone with tectonic um, movements and erosion. And in the last 2 million years here in blue, we signify ice coming and going in those mountains um, to shape them. Also, we had the, the eruptions over the last 200,000 years that were on top of, underneath, and adjacent to the ice. And that's where the fire and ice moniker comes from. And because of those eruptions hitting the ice, they commonly are unstable materials that are perched at high elevation, and they're prone to collapse. So you can see here in black, things collapsing down. So especially after the slope support from the glaciers and the valleys was removed um, at about 10, 11,000 years ago to the present, these things have been collapsing into the valleys. And then of course, moving into the future, this, these processes exacerbated by climate change. So we're seeing more and more large landslides on these edifices because of the loading by more extreme weather events. <clears throat> this just gives you a sense uh, Vancouver of the, the geopark, Vancouver's down here to the south, Mount Meager up here in the north, and you can see all, our geo sites are linked to our four pillars, mountain building, glaciation, oops, sorry about that, glaciation, volcanism, and collapse, and it's about 10,000 square kilometers, so it's a very large area that we're incorporating in this narrative, and that's about the size, if anyone's ever been to or heard of Yellowstone National Park, it's on the same scale as Yellowstone National Park. And so we have all of our different geosites. Um, and right now we're we're populating a, an app and a website with these geosites giving descriptions. So if you're thinking about coming to this area for any reason, uh, that can kind of be part of your tour guide as, as um, Russell was indicating. And so within the, within the geopark, uh, we have sort of fire and ice. So glacial volcanism is the interaction of volcanic eruptions and glaciers. And so I mentioned the Juan de Fuca plate here, moving to the east underneath North America and creating all these volcanic materials. And then up here, uh, the continuation into Canada, it's called the Garibaldi Volcanic Belt. And just a few examples of what these look like. Um, Mount Meager, as I've talked about, you can see a, a pumice mine here in the foreground and Mount Meager is this jagged peak in, in the background. And the difference between the, the Cascade volcanoes of the US, they're sort of you know, nice conical shapes, and those we have up here in Canada, ours are built on top of the, the coast mountains rather than kind of being on their own. And so, the, and there's much been much more glaciation up here. So they're they're ragged uh, looking mountains that are they're torn apart by by collapse. Um, example of subglacial eruption is this little ring mountain. It's a really cool spot. Um, fly out there, pretty much only get it to it in a helicopter. And um, it's an example of of part of a Garibaldi volcanic belt. The table and the black tusk are famous uh, parts of this um, right next to Garibaldi Lake, which I'll talk about today. And then Mount Garibaldi above here, House Sound Fjord in Squamish, instead of looking like a nice cone, a quarter of this is down in the valley because it's a supraglacial volcano that was actually built on top of the Cordier and Ice Sheet uh, over the last you know, 30 or 40,000 years. And then, of course, the Cordier and Ice Sheet has Almost all, you can see a little glacier there, almost all melted away. And gravitationally, this volcano has collapsed into the Squamish Valley, creating what's called the Chikai Fan. So we have a lot of local hazards around here um, that are certainly part of the geopark narrative and part of living in this region um, on a daily basis. The beauty and the hazard. So what I have here is Alex Wilson is a, he's a PhD student that graduated from University of British Columbia in Vancouver. I was working with him on his PhD. And what we're gonna show you here is 
it'll pop up in red will be the volcanic rocks in the area and ice will come and go over the last 200,000 years. So again, Vancouver to the south, Squamish here, this is the Chicamas Valley going up to Whistler, which we'll talk about um, in this presentation. And Garibaldi Lake is, is right here in this area, just to give you a sense where it is. Of course, I'll show it to you again. Over here on the left, we have the global sea level curve from um, marine records. And what we do with these volcanoes is because we can date them because they're erupted volcanic rocks, we can then say how much ice was in the area at their time of eruption and create a more robust paleoclimate curve for this area. So you can see the different eruptions coming and going. Some were underneath ice, some were when it was ice free, and others were sort of halfway in between. And so lots of eruptions that have interacted with ice, um, again, beneath, against, or on top of uh, this area. So we get these beautiful landscapes that allow us to say a lot about the paleoclimate in the area. So what I'm gonna talk about today specifically is mapping of, of Garibaldi Lake. So this slide is just to give you um, a sense of the terms and the places that I'm talking about. So Garibaldi Lake is, is here. It's perched at an elevation of 1400 meters and it is a trillion liters of water. So it's a very large lake. It's you know 300 meters deep as we'll see here in a minute, uh, perched up here at high elevation. This is Clinker Peak where the eruption that caused the formation of the lake uh, occurred. This is the barrier that we'll talk about down here. And then Rubble Creek is coming out from beneath the barrier. And this is Lesser Garibaldi Lake, the smaller one here. So that's just to set things up in terms of what is where, and then uh, these will come back throughout this talk. Um, I just want you to see how they all interact with each other without all the science. Okay, so now let's zoom in on Garibaldi Lake and tell the story of how we think it formed. So right here again is, is Clinker Peak and it erupted about 11,000 years ago. And this is the lava flow coming down slope from Clinker Peak. You can see the levees on the lava flow here. The trees really stand out on the edges of that. And what happened is it came down here. And at the time that this erupted, the Cordier and Ice Sheet was rapidly retreating. So the Chicamas Valley down here was still full of ice because it takes longer for the valley glacier, thick valley glacier to melt. So you still had ice in the valleys. You still had ice in the high mountains like we do today, but there was an ice-free window here at, at mid elevation. And we know that because in these areas, this lava flow didn't interact with that ice. However, as you can see, it comes down here. It kind of takes a left-hand turn and stops right here. And it was trying to go down the Paleo Valley, which was right here, and it stopped because of the ice. And so this lava flow actually dammed now this valley and created the barrier, which is a 300 meter tall cliff. A day site lava flow is normally 30 or 40 meters thick, uh, but this is 300 meters thick. So it's very much over thickened because the lava flow came down and hit the ice and then filled in the valley. So when you filled in that valley, all the snow melt and rainwater collected behind it to create Garibaldi Lake. So I like to say it's kind of a conspiracy of geologic events to create this beautiful lake, very large lake, deep lake at high elevation. Of course, behind an unstable volcanic dam upstream from population center. So it gets people's attention uh, in the area as a potential geologic hazard. So the, I'll just play the model here from 16,400 years to the present, and we can see the eruption that I'm talking about here, the barrier lava flow, was when we had this ice-free window right in here, the valley, Chicamas Valley is still full of ice, the lava flow came down and hit that ice. And then of course, since then, all the ice in the valley has gone and there's still some remnant glaciers up here at high elevation. And so I'm trained as a volcanologist, so we learned in school, you have to show an active lava flow because that's really what people wanna see when they uh, deal with volcanologists. So this is in Hawaii, of course, uh, very approachable lava flows. I've run a lot of field trips there, but there is a reason for me to show this to you. And that's because volcanology can be very simple. This lava flow is of course flowing at me and the crust of it is ductile. So it's, it's a bit solid, but still able to deform. And it's creating these smiley faces, these pressure ridges giving us the direction of flow. So you can see that they're convex in the direction of, of flow. And that allows us to 
say on these basaltic lava flows that we can approach that indeed this was flowing this direction. So we know when it cools that we can interpret the direction of that flow. And that um, process occurs on lava flows of all sides. So now we can look at this big day site lava flow, uh, more viscous, but still pretty long lava flow. And you can see these pressure ridges giving us with these arrows now the direction that the flows must have been going. So the main flow coming down being deflected by the ice in the valley, you can see here dotted in blue. And then um, a couple of other lava flows coming, going into what is now the lake based on those um, pressure ridges. And then a question about how little Lesser Garibaldi Lake formed here. And then also questions about what's underneath Garibaldi Lake to try to put together more detail on this story of how this uh, lake formed. And so I started looking into this project and one of my motivations was this amazing map that was made of the lake bottom by Bill Matthews. And so each one of these dots is a depth that he created um, using a rope and a weight. So he must have canoed, he must have hiked a canoe up there and canoed around and made this map and filled it in um, contours. And of course there's limitations with a rope and a weight. And so you can only get so many uh, depth soundings. And so I thought, well, it's been 50, 60, 70 years since he did this. Let's go back with some modern technology and see if we can see a little bit more, especially here in this region where these lava flows are interacting with what is now the lake and see if we can say more about this system. So I first looked into this and I thought, well, sonar, right? Sonar is the way to go. And what I learned was sonar is uh, essentially outdated. And uh, Jess, you won't, this is the part of the talk that you won't get, but I'll play it for some of us. Re-verify our range to target. One ping only. Captain, I, I, I just, give me a ping, Vasily. One ping only, please. All right, Captain. Jess, that's The Hunt for Red October, a famous movie, Tom Clancy novel. Um, so essentially, sonar being a simplified, you know, a sound, one sound pulse going down, pulse going down and then coming back, and you can get the depth of whatever um, lake in that case you would be in, in this case you would be in, uh, by doing that. But in about 2015, 2016, something called chirp came, became very um, inexpensive. And so cheap chirp, if you will, is this compressed high intensity radiated pulse. So which within each uh, sounding, they're able to put more than one frequency. So you can get a much higher resolution map of the lake bottom. And the system that I'll show you here is on the order of, you know, 800 to 1,000 uh, Canadian dollars at the time that I that I purchased it. So relatively inexpensive and accessible. Um, it's essentially a, 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 a nice fish finder. Uh, that you can use for this purpose. And I strapped it to a paddleboard, as we'll see here in a second. Okay, so I'm just going to use this here we are Young Man to explain Lake, it. Just getting ready to do some mapping. I just wanted to explain the, the setup that I have here. So I have an inflatable paddleboard. I've inflated it up. It's inverted right now. I've turned it over so I can show you the transducer for the sonar system. So this is my fin that slots in and out. I've put the transducer on the fin. That's sending the signal to the bottom of the lake and capturing the response for the sonar. And I'm making sure that it's going to be horizontal and parallel to the lake bottom as I'm paddling. What I have here, which you'll see later on top of the paddleboard, is the brains of the unit. So this is my mapping unit. That's what controls the sonar, collects the data, and then I just have it hooked up to a 12 volt battery and sealed into this Pelican case to avoid it getting wet. Okay, so I must now, by uh, contractual obligation, mention if you're looking into paddleboards, especially inflatable paddleboards, Kahuna paddleboards would be the way you would want to go. <laughs> no, I say that because I called them up and they donated this paddleboard to me. Uh, very nice of them to do, making it possible for me to set this up, um, in particular for less mapping Lesser Garibaldi Lake with a student. And so here's a little bit more about how the system works. 
Okay, so now I have the system set up as we will when we paddle it. You can see that obviously the board is flat on the water. And now my transducer is down here in the water, flat to the bottom. This cable is running up here to the unit. And what I'm able to do as I'm paddling is I can see the tracks on this unit. So I'm able to cover the lake in a specified pattern. Or if I can just randomly paddle all around it, it will map as well. And what I just need to do by the end is make sure I've covered enough of the lake in a systematic way to get the sonar signal from the bottom so it can interpolate in between my tracks. So pretty fun and uh, quite an enjoyable activity, especially in, in nice weather. All right, so long day of paddling, but I think I got this lake wrapped up. And so what I do is I just go home, plot it up on the computer. I can see the tracks, I can see what I've covered and see if I have to come back and do this uh, enjoyable activity anymore. Okay, so um, Garibaldi Lake, where I got the main funding from the National Geographic Society to do this, is too big to paddleboard, uh, especially because the weather comes up, the catabatic winds, and you're too far from, from shore to be safe. So uh, Jeff Mullins, shown here, and I, we flew a little dinghy up there with a motor and strapped the same system to the little dinghy. Um, there was another boat that I would use. Um, I, I called myself Captain Glass because this is about as rough a water as I would go out on the boat on. Um, I'm not, a, I didn't grow as a, as we learned by the comedian, I grew up in the cornfields of Illinois, so not a lot of experience on, on these mountain lakes. But um, we had a really good time mapping this lake. Uh, he was out there for about five days of mapping from about 5 a.m. To, to 10 p.m. He'd be out there. And these are his tracks that he made on the lake. And so um, on all these maps, red is very shallow. So of course, zero at the, at the shoreline. And then blue, as you get towards blue, it's deeper. And so you can see he did a very nice job of systematically covering the lake. And then I asked him to cover this area uh, sort of on the west side of the lake in more detail because we wanted to know more again about those lava flows interacting um, with what used to be the Paleo Valley and see what we could say about that. So here are the results. Uh, sorry, this is so small, but I think it's uh, 270 meters here in the darkest blue. So we have this flat area in the middle of 270 meters deep. We have kind of a normal glacial valley here with the Sentinel Glacier now retreating up into the mountains. And then we have this undulating plateau on the western edge. And I'll just rotate things around here in a little 3D model. Um, and if we look at this plateau, it starts to look an awful lot like the toe of what you see on, on the sort of a terrestrial lava flow on the surface. And so this we think is, is probably the, the flat bottom Paleo Valley, maybe with a little sedimentation with the lava flow coming in here and kind of the normal Paleo Valley going back up into the mountains. And this is essentially the dam that um, was created by the lava flows with the barrier down here. So we were able to, to sort of see more uh, from Matthews's map with the depth soundings in more detail. And so let's just look at it on Google Earth again here. So this lava flow came down, pressure ridges telling us that the lava was coming this way, hit the barrier. And then what probably happened was that created magma static pressure, over pressure in this, and it started breaking out from its levees. Pressure ridges showing us these lava flows were moving in this direction towards what is now the lake. And this lava flow and this lava flow competing um, to get there. And it looks like this lava, this lobe of the lava got there first, came all the way out uh, about a kilometer into what is now the lake and created this undulating plateau on the west hand, uh, the west side of the lake. And then it was, this lava flow was sort of cut off by that. We had some higher resolution, uh, a sonar system from, from Simon Fraser University that was sort of in a beta phase, testing phase. And you can see here, uh, the, the bright colors are shallower and the darker colors are deeper. And again, you can see these pressure ridges being now seen in the subsurface. So a nice confirmation that indeed these are lava flows in the subsurface that um, allows us to give the dynamics of the formation. You know, this happened first and then this happened. And then also we can figure out where the lava flows are in the lake. And that's very important as we talk about later where the water in the lake is actually going and how this large um, hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic system is behaving. So we feel really good about this map. 
uh, to give us, a, we can now sort of map underneath the water with, with great accuracy um, for what's matching up to what's on land. Um, we wanted to also look, I had a student, this is um, Martin Lentz, and we wanted to look at the smaller Lesser Garibaldi Lake, which is right down here, because it's part of the system as well. You can see in this image, it's very low. So both of these lakes fluctuate with time uh, throughout the seasons, as I'll talk about. But also, why is this little lake here? Why didn't the lava flow fill in this low area behind the barrier dam? So we went out and um, got the paddleboard out, flew it up there with the helicopter, and he mapped this lake for his undergraduate thesis. This is, uh, I think, 25 meters depth, this bowl right here. And on this edge of the lake, the right-hand side here, again, you see one of these undulating plateaus. So we, from, from this view, say, oh, that must be a lava flow that came in. And it has this very vertically exaggerated, but very steep um, front to it. So we think there's a lava flow that came in. Maybe it hit a block of ice that was stranded or something during uh, the retreat of the glaciers. We're still trying to think about um, how this lake formed rather than that lava flow simply filling in the um, topographic low. And so we can look here again, this is, is Lesser Garibaldi Lake, the lava flow coming down here, breaking through its levee, coming down and hitting the ice potentially here and stopping it. And this creek right now, which is called, I call it overflow creek because it overflows out of the lake, is the contact between all these lavas and the bedrock over here of the Paleo Valley. So this bedrock of the Paleo Valley would have gone down beneath um, these, these existing lava flows, or does go down beneath these existing lava flows. And so one more cool thing we can do with the cheap chirp is confirm that, that it's a lava flow in the subsurface. So you can see the little boat here is the paddleboard moving towards that end of the lake. And what we have here is the reflection and the downscan of water here in black and the lake bottom here in the brighter yellow. And here the water is sort of bluish and the reflective of the lake bottom is here. So as we get towards that edge, we start to see not only the undulation of those um, pressure ridges on the lava flow, but you actually start to see the spiny top of the lava flow in this image. So the clinker that forms on the top of these lava flows, these lakes are too cold to have any vegetation on the bottom of them. So we actually think that we're seeing this, this is on land, of course, we think we're seeing that spiny top of the lava flow. And so that's really great that we can use this relatively inexpensive system to get that sort of uh, detail at the bottom of this lake and confirm again, this is a lava flow going into Lesser Garibaldi Lake from the main lava flow here. So again, we have this question of why didn't the lava fill in that, that area there? And also we have a question of Rubble Creek is coming out from beneath the barrier. So this is Rubble Creek. You can see it's springing out from beneath the system. Where the heck is that water coming from? And how can we figure out where that water is coming from? So that's the next part of the research. So now I'm down below the barrier. You can actually see uh, it's a spooky place to be. The barrier is right up here. You can actually see some rock fall, little dust trails from rocks falling down here. It happens all the time. Some of my instrumentation got taken out down here. There's the trace of, of rock fall. It's a very spooky place to work. But this um, water, as you can see, is springing out right at the contact between the bedrock, which is right here going underneath the scree slope of the barrier, which is slowly collapsing. And so the, we think the water is flowing along that scree slope um, coming from Garibaldi Lake. And so what we did is we said, okay, I had a student, Tanea Dillman, who said, let's put some pressure transducers in the water. So we know how much water is above it and we can correct for barometric pressure and we can get a sense for how much water is in the lake, how much water is flowing out of the lake and how much water is coming out of Rebel Creek and try to figure out how the balance of water in the system works. And so we put one here at the, at the dock um, in the summertime, the dock is full of people. Um, and in the summertime, of course, as well, the water is, comes up to the level of the dock. And you can see here in the winter, or actually in the spring, as the, the lake is starting to, to melt, how far down the lake level is. And that's because of the water seeping out 
underneath here out to Rubble Creek. So we wanted to measure with the seasons how much water is flowing out of, out of the lake and then how much is coming out of Rubble Creek to get a sense for how does this weird system created by fire and ice behave and, and can we use that behavior to say anything about what hazards might be um, present. So here are my three data collection systems. This is Garibaldi Lake here in blue, Overflow Creek I call it here in orange, and then Rubble Creek down at the bottom of the barrier here in um, gray. And this is just the amount of water, this, it's just done by stage, but um, it's essentially the height of water above a certain arbitrary figure. And so you can see here over the summer into the fall of 2015, the Garibaldi Lake was essentially going down with time and it was tracking with Overflow Creek. So as the lake got high, more water of course went out of the lake into Overflow Creek. And as, as Garibaldi Lake goes down with time, there's less overflow into Overflow Creek. Interestingly, Rubble Creek doesn't really care. It stays pretty flat. And so we think it's sort of decoupled from the system. It's connected, of course, but we think the amount of water in Garibaldi Lake doesn't really determine how much water is coming out at Rubble Creek. Um, unfortunately, this got cut off because the landslide, like I said, took out my Rubble Creek sensor. And um, so I was unable to continue collecting this data. And so it was down here. And what we found though is with the seasons, just by other observations, this is a constant amount of water coming out of these eight different springs. Uh, you can just see two of them here. And it's at about three cubic meters per second year round. So by the time all the springs collect together, it will knock you over uh, the amount of water. And so it's coming out here, you can see right on the contact of the bedrock with this three above it and then we think it's flowing along the contact between the lava flow and the bedrock below it. Of course, that contact is porous and permeable um, because as it hits the, the ground, it creates its own clinker at the bottom. So I had an ingen ingenious student say she wanted to work up here and, and wanted to work on some sort of hydrogeology project. And so she came up with the idea that in the winter time, this system would be, um, a frozen top, so it'd be a closed system. So in the summer, you have rain and you have snow melt, and it's very hard to quantify how much water is coming into the lake from where. Um, so it's more dynamic. But in the winter, the lake freezes. You can see us walking on it here. And so she decided she wanted to look at the lake level over the winter to see if that matched with the amount of water coming out of Rubble Creek and if indeed the water, all the water was just coming out of the bottom. Okay going on. All right, there we go. And so this is Madeline Martin, and she created this system with um, an anchor and the data logger here at the bottom and some corks and rope and a buoy at the top. And she drilled some holes in the ice and then threw it down one of these holes and left it over the winter. And so what you can see here is from about Valentine's Day to when the lake uh, starts to unfreeze a little bit here in May, you had a consistent drop in lake level with time. So that gives us a really good sense that over the winter, this water is going out of Rubble Creek um, in a consistent way. And so it must be, and we, we have yet to do the hydro, hydro, uh, hydrology analysis because I get intimidated by Darcy's law and I start to do it. And then every time I just kind of kind of quit on it, but we think it's gonna, it matches up quite well to that three cubic meters per second that we're measuring at Rubble Creek. So we've been able to learn quite a bit about this system uh, from these studies. And one of the important things is, that, is this water is coming out from beneath this dam. And of course, that's not the, the most stable system in the world to have uh, an unstable volcanic material with water forcing its way underneath it. And one of the important things is this water is flowing out and this, dam, this dammed lake is right above the Chicamas Valley, which Highway 99 and the railroad uh, go from Vancouver to Squamish and then up to Whistler up in this valley. And that's essentially the only route that exists for uh, transportation in the area. And so not only is the, is the barrier sitting there as an unstable edifice with this big lake above it, but also you can see here 
This is called lobe four. It's part of the barrier system and it has these little joints on it, all this hackly texture. And that is primary contact with ice textures. And the reason that, that troubles people is because it has essentially not collapsed yet. And so there's been several collapses into the valley uh, over time that it would have now um, dammed the Chicamas River and closed the highway, of course. And the last one to happen was in the 1970s. And they actually moved a village uh, called Garibaldi from right down here. Uh, it's the first time in British Columbia history the government has paid to relocate people because of a natural hazard. So we're keeping our eyes on this. Um, there's more and more research being done in this area uh, by different researchers monitoring barrier and monitoring uh, this part of the system for the potential hazard. So that's what I've got today, um, talking about fire and ice and the formation of Garibaldi Lake.